Hello, City Campus. So nice to see you all. Are you doing well? Everybody online, good evening. Great to have you connected with us as well. Wherever you are streaming from, you are in for a powerful next few moments. Shade, Tristan, love to see you on the front row. Coordinated tonight, you look great. Has to be done. Has to, that's marriage right there, right there. Are you feeling good, City Campus? Yeah, all the way at the back, are you doing good tonight? Does this feel great to be back in the room or what? Uh, this is the clapping service for sure, as George has already identified. But uh, so, so nice to be with you. And uh, it really is an honor uh, to be spending a Saturday night together after so many months watching a screen. There's nothing like being in the room, standing side by side with people we love, people we care about, people we're invested in, and then also turning our attention to our God who we love, who we are living for, who our lives are transformed by. And there is something so beautiful about what happens in the room. And I want to speak to that tonight. Um, before I dive into it, why don't you turn around and why don't you elbow or wave or peace sign or however you need to do it to be COVID safe tonight. Just get friendly for a moment. 6 p.m. service. Go for it. Go for it. Thank you, team. You guys did incredible. Christian Colback, bassist extraordinaire. He's getting married as well. How many more months, Christian? Weeks. One week. One month, one month. That is incredible, man. Worth the wait, hey? So, so good. Well, that was endearing, right? I, I, that was meant to be encouraging. I love Christian. One of the best, one of the best. Well, last weekend, Vision Weekend for us as a church is quite profound. Uh, it's also quite prophetic. It speaks to the next 12 months for us as a church and what we are uh, Endeavoring to believe for, endeavoring to achieve together as a church and as is our custom in this house, our senior pastor took the stage and Brian and Bobby spoke to it and out of his mouth and out of the presentation came these words that for us as a church will frame uh, the next few months and uh, the next year. It will become, dare I say, our reality uh, that we walk into. Are you with me tonight? Do you believe what we received Last weekend will be our reality that we will experience that year, that, uh, that this year with our community and with our church. Those words that Pastor Brian spoke, rescue, restore, and rebuild, rebuild. That's right. I want to tonight attempt to compliment what uh, he gave such great expression to. And I want to um, speak that same idea or those same words, rescue, restore, and rebuild uh, around the idea of what we are doing in this place tonight. I want to rescue, restore, and rebuild uh, our conviction about this, our why when it comes to uh, this gathering tonight and the fact that you and I ended up in the same room together on a Saturday night, what this is all about. And if you're online, you're included as well. But I want to speak to rescuing, restoring, and rebuilding our sense of reverence about this meeting and this gathering, this coming together in this place that we call home. Hebrews speaks to this and let me just uh, set up this message and where we're going with this passage of Scripture in the Passion Translation, if we could. Do we have it up on the screen, guys? Um, it says, discover creative ways, City Campus, to encourage others and to motivate them toward acts of compassion, doing beautiful works as expressions of love. It goes on, this is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together. How profound these words for this season right now. As some have formed the habit of doing, in fact, we should come together even more frequently, eager to encourage and urge each other onward as we anticipate the day coming, the day that Christ Returns. What a powerful uh, couple of verses that articulate uh, some of what we are about, the business of church, the business of people like us, and what we are endeavoring to establish in and through our relationships, in and through our engagement with one another, in and through our church, our church life, our living and breathing, our existing, our coming and going, 
I think Hebrews gives great expression to the heartbeat of it all. I wanted to also, before I pray tonight, ask if there's anybody in the room and uh, if you could participate, I would be really grateful. It would really help this example. But if you're in the room tonight and you have been a part of City Campus for more than five years, could I ask that just for a moment you stand to your feet? If you've been a part of City Campus for more than five years, why don't you stand to your feet? How cool is that? Have a look around the room tonight. and Yeah, you can clap or cheer and... It's pretty amazing. Oh, you stay standing, please stay standing. It'll only be a moment longer, about 20 minutes. But um, now you are incredible. Look around the room. Uh, so many phenomenal people, couples, individuals, families, generations represented by those who are standing tonight. And uh, I wanted to get you to stand as a way of exampling the fact that there are those in our midst that have been a part of this and have had a conviction about this for many, many years. And if you're in here tonight for the first time ever, um, this is amazing what you see, what you're sitting amongst. People that have believed in this room, believed in this community, sacrificed for it, loved it, prayed about it, had faith for it, year in, year out, for five years plus. Wendy's been in here for a little bit longer than that, as we just heard, but how amazing, and I think they deserve our honor, they deserve our acknowledgement, but, but then also, uh, we get to exist in community together, and so you and I get to draw from their example, draw from their legacy, draw from the life that they have lived, and be inspired together from this point on, that 2021, actually, these heroes in our midst, we get to rub shoulders with, we get to learn how uh, they, they stayed. We get to learn how they dug their heels in. We get to learn longevity in and through their lives. And so if you're standing tonight, round of applause. We love you, appreciate you, and so grateful that you have exampled us. Why don't you take a seat? Take a seat. Thank you so much. You have exampled us for many, many years. Sunday in, Sunday out. Connect group in, connect group out. Coffee in, coffee out. Sisterhood in, sisterhood out, uh, service after service, volunteering volu after volunteering, and you have exampled us. I want to speak a message tonight, church, and it's titled this, A Tradition of Us. Why don't you write that down if you're taking notes tonight? A Tradition of Us. I think this year uh, we need to recommit, we need to realign, we need to reestablish a tradition of us in our lives. Now, could we pray to that end tonight? Lord, I thank you. That some way, somehow, we ended up here on a Saturday night, and God, I just believe that you had a whole lot to do with it. That I'm sitting here, uh, that we're in the room together, I'm actually standing, but, but everybody else is sitting, and, and we're in this service together, and right now we open our hearts to what you might want to do in these next few moments, what you might want to encourage us with or speak to us about. God, we may have big questions of faith and God, or maybe we've been on this journey for five years, 10 years, 15 years, but God, tonight we all come with a desire to learn a little bit more about you and encounter Jesus in a real and transformative way. And so God, we say now together, have your way. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, and everybody said, amen. amen. A tradition of us. I was thinking recently about Christmas time. And um, I just had that experience about eight weeks ago. And uh, the Fagan family like does Christmas just at level 10. It is, it is crazy. Level 10 is as high as it goes. And uh, there is so much excitement. There is so much energy. Um, cousins, aunties, uncles, forever. That has kind of been how we do Christmas. There's this huge building, mum's making calls, writing things on calendars, and, and then everybody rolls in. And as a kid growing up, Christmas was a time of year like no other. Anybody else relate tonight? It gets a little wild, no one's sleeping, everyone's spending money on presents and food, and um, the Christmas belly appears, and it is just wild. And, and so the Fagan Christmas, this is kind of how it goes for us. Christmas Eve, everybody rolled into our house. Everyone turned up, aunties, uncles, about 20 different cousins, and everybody was at our house for the night, and um, Santa would come down the street just on sunset. For some reason, I was thinking about it this afternoon, Santa would come down the street on the back of the local garbage truck. Did anybody remember that? And would throw lollies off the truck at all the kids running along like chasing the garbage truck. Such a weird picture. How good is Australia? Um, 
And, and we would do that every single year. And then we would, for whatever reason, have like pizza. And uh, it was awesome. All the kids knew that Christmas Eve we had pizza together. It was amazing. We'd stay up as late as we could. We'd lay out our little Christmas sacks under the tree. The next morning, we would wake up as early as possible, screaming, shouting. All the parents would wake up grumpy, needing coffee. We'd get to the tree, do the presents. Nan would cook breakfast. This is every year, year after year after year. Same thing would happen. Nan would do um, breakfast, we'd all eat that, and then we'd all exchange more presents for one another, individual presents that we'd bought. We just did presents under the tree, but then we'd do more presents, and then we'd have lunch, and the uncles would cook this huge, big feast on the barbecue, and we'd do that, and then after lunch, we'd all yell and scream and try and pick a movie that we would end up watching together. It was usually like the new Pixar release or something, and then within 20 minutes, we'd all be asleep like just all over the place in the house, pull up a carpet, like a bit of carpet and grab a pillow hopefully and we'd just pass out for the next couple of hours and, and then the day after Christmas we would get in the car, all our aunties, uncles, cousins and for two weeks we would go north up the coast and celebrate and holiday and have the best time. Every single year we did that. That was the Fagan family Christmas tradition. Every year, same thing. And I guess you could say that we started to associate certain things with Christmas because of tradition. I think tradition is a powerful thing. Tradition is something that brings us together. Tradition is something that means something to each and every one of us. There's different kinds of traditions, right? There are celebratory traditions, there are Christmas traditions, birthday traditions, wedding traditions, marriage traditions, spiritual traditions. I wonder tonight, thinking about your own life and your own relationships, uh, maybe your marriage, your spouse, maybe you have some traditions, maybe your family, with your kids, maybe you have created traditions over the years. What kind of traditions have you created? Uh, What comes to mind for you tonight? Why don't you just turn to your neighbor and let them know like the first tradition that came to mind for you this evening. Go for it. Wow, Tristan and Shay just look so in love down here sharing their tradition. Okay, smiles, little nervous giggles. This is good, this is good. Traditions. Can I give you the definition? This is what a tradition is. This is how it's defined. It is a belief or behavior passed down within a group or society with symbolic meaning or special significance with origins in the past. Uh, One sociologist wrote of traditions and humans' interactions and, and said this, we humans are remarkably social species and traditions help bring us together. Whenever families and friends have lived in communities, we have adopted group rituals and customs which strengthen our bonds with each other. These provide us with experiences of shared values and mutual comfort. They also offer us time for reflection and relaxation and relief from the pressures of our daily lives. Tradition. Tradition. A tradition of us. I'd like to submit it to you tonight that 2021 will look drastically different if you commit to a tradition of us. A tradition of us. Not a convenience, not an obligation, not an inconsistency, not a calendar event that you can decline or accept. This is something, a tradition of us is something we desperately need. It is grounding. It reminds me, it reminds you of what's important. A tradition of us is actually a holy tradition that has been passed on from generation to generation and that I want my life to pass on. I think that many more in this room would would say the same of your life and your example and your legacy to those around you, to your kids, to your children. A tradition of us, it reassures, it helps us believe and belong, it forms identity. This centers me, it removes me from the chaos and helps me hold on to the truth. Are you with me tonight, church? This is my safe place, my refuge, my strong tower, my watering hole, my people, my God, and my home, a tradition of us. 
uh, that what we are doing here tonight is more than just a 90-minute service that is religious obligation, but there's something of substance in the air tonight that there's something spiritually connecting all of us, that there is something of deep importance generationally that is taking place that we sit amongst tonight, that there is something of prophetic nature in the air tonight, that there is something of uh, the Holy Spirit bonding you and I together and forming something for our future in and through this room and in and through what we represent. A tradition of us constantly throughout the New Testament the writers who were writing letters and encouragements and imploring the communities of the day, they were constantly coming back to, do not forget the importance of us. Do not forget the importance of community. It is vital to your faith and vital to your future. Vital to this message reaching every person that it needs to reach. Right through the New Testament, example after example, let me read you a few. Hebrews 10 verse 25. Do not neglect meeting together, church, as is the habit of son, but encourage one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you. Let it dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another. All wisdom uh, through psalms, hymns and songs from the Holy Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 14.26 says this, What then, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, A revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation, everything must be done for the building up of the church. Acts 2 verse 46, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Over and over and over and over again throughout the New Testament, uh, the leaders, the teachers, the apostles, the prophets were imploring the community of God Don't forget about community. Don't forget about us, your brothers and your sisters in the faith. Don't forget about the importance of grounding yourself in that place. And with those people, it is going to develop you. It is going to transform you. And also your life has a role to play in their spiritual formation. A tradition of us. Uh, During my time here in the the city campus, I actually uh, came to meet a a whole bunch of amazing uh, South African people. And there's uh, quite a few and uh, formed some special friendships with them and hold them dear to my heart and really, really important people that have played big roles in my life. But you know what I I found really interesting? Um, In talking with them at different points and a bunch of these people don't know each other and they they aren't quite connected or in the same social circles, but they're South African nonetheless. And in talking with them at different times, they have all brought forth this idea that is African philosophy. And at different times, in different settings, they have brought it forth and, and presented it as something that is so dear to them and so valuable to them that their roots have taught them. And it's this word that, is really just a a simple word, a a word for them. It's one word that represents so much that is loaded with potential, loaded with community, loaded with what it means to live and breathe and exist within a group like this. And and it's this word that they've shared uh, with me on many occasions. It's this word and it's Ubuntu. Ubuntu, have you heard of that before? And it is African philosophy and And for them, they know exactly what it means. It's deep, it's rich, it it is powerful, it is uh, community transforming. And and this is what it means uh, for them. And they've shared with me and it's changed my life. It means this, I am because we are. Wow. What a powerful understanding of what community could mean for us. I am because we are. That actually my existence, my uh, maturity, my development, that that my being, it actually is dependent upon you. And that your development, your maturity, uh, your growth, uh, the experience of life that you have is actually dependent upon this community or the community that you ground yourself in. I am because we are. That I, I, I do not actually exist in isolation, that that would be detrimental to who I am and who I'm becoming, but, but I need people. Uh, the people are where I find support and comfort, are where I find challenge and rebuke. People are where I find that sharpening that my life so desperately needs. That if I'm honest, 
I lacked a little last year because of the nature of the year and, and what was. There were a lot of circumstances and challenges and situations that presented themselves and, and I desperately needed community but couldn't have it the way that we have it right now. I am because we are. I just think that is such a powerful idea for us to entertain at the beginning of this year as we endeavor to rescue, restore, and rebuild. Uh, what the enemy has tried to take away or uh, bring devastation to or bring division to, that you and I uh, could recommit this, this idea of community, this idea of us and the importance of it in our lives. Uh, that we wouldn't desire or we wouldn't try and live at a distance, but we would throw ourselves into uh, what it means to be family, what it means to live in a home together, what it means to be community, what it means to encourage one another, what it means to annoy one another and yet overcome and learn from it and grow from it. We need all of that. And that is the power of community in our lives. The idea of shared humanity, that we were created for community. I fundamentally believe that, uh, that that is a biblical, that that is theological, that God created you and me for community, that actually uh, we live and breathe and exist for this, that my life, that my purposes, that my gifts and my talents, they flourish when I dig my roots into godly community. I am because we are a tradition of us. I wanna turn our attention now to a passage of scripture which I think really exemplifies uh, characteristics of us. And Psalm 27 is a David psalm. King David wrote this. And um, I, I kind of wrestled with this for a bit and then I had an epiphany. And can I share the epiphany with you tonight? Uh, David is writing a psalm and expressing his heart to God. It is a personal psalm. It is somewhat of a prayer or a lament or a song. And David is expressing emotions in a private space. Him and God are sharing this. And so I wanted to draw out characteristics from this psalm about community, and yet the context of this psalm is David and God. But it became apparent to me that David was a leader of community, and so what was happening in his life influenced the community that he was leading. And also, you and I, we live this cruciform life. Have you heard that term before? Uh, that the cross, there is a vertical dimension and a horizontal dimension. And for every single one of us, our relationship with God teaches us how to relate with humanity. And so actually, if there's anyone we can learn from tonight, it's David as he is wrestling out some of his emotions with God, bringing it before God. In that relationship, we can learn how to relate to the person on my left and my right and in this room this evening. And so I think there's a lot that we can learn from David's prayer this evening. Are you with me? Are you with me, City Campus? Online, I hope you're engaged and learning and taking notes this evening. I wanna share with us tonight and bring to our attention three characteristics of us that should define us. When we gather, when we're together, our relationships and what we're all about. Three characteristics of us that we see in this prayer that David prays. Uh, the first characteristic is found in verses one through three. And I believe that this is a characteristic that we need to commit to and we need to be about this year, and it is this, honest fear. David expresses, he exemplifies honest fear. Isn't that somewhat of a paradox, Sam? How does that work, honest fear? Uh, we'll see in a moment, David crying out to the Lord and praying here, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? Uh, probably worthwhile noting that David is writing this in the face of opposition, writing this in the face of challenge, writing this as, as the enemy surrounds, writing this with real threat upon his life. And this is what he pens. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear, church? The Lord is my stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me and my heart will not fear, though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. Honest fear. David faced much opposition Opposing nations and armies, Saul, 
uh, trying to kill him. David even faced the enemy of himself. And yet in this moment, he is penning this prayer of honesty before God, bringing it all before the Lord. Hey, there's a lesson to be learned from 2020 right there that you can freely bring all of that before God. Your doubts, your concerns, your fears, your complaints, the annoyances, the frustrations, the things that went really well last year and the things that you still have no idea. How did that happen? Why did that happen? David invites us in and through his example to bring that all before the Lord, to have an honest fear about what we are facing. Hey God, this is annoying me. I, I've got questions. Uh, God, I'm frustrated. God, I'm, I'm actually fearful. I'm worried. I'm stressed. We can bring that before the Lord. We don't need to hide it or feel like we don't measure up or meet some standard that is out there. David brought all of those emotions before God. And we will see his transformation as we continue in and through this psalm. David is a great example for our faith, a brutal honesty before God. Come as you are. Hebrews 4, 16 tells us in the New Testament, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Confidence, confidence, not timidity, not shameful, not bashful, not scared of what might happen. Confidence. Tonight, if you're in this room, you have every reason, every invitation to surrender and enter in and connect with God with confidence that He loves you, that you're accepted, that you belong. We should have every confidence so that we may receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. You know, we're a, a messy church that doesn't have it all together. I love Pastor Brian and Bobby's honesty and transparency last weekend and uh, things we're learning over the years, decades of doing church. You know what? It all comes back to the fact that sometimes we are ourselves hurting and broken people because of life and ourselves. And, and yet the amazing truth of the gospel and the God that we serve is that we're not banished or put outside or rejected. We're invited into community and to bring to God our honest fears. I think David examples uh, one characteristic of community that's so important that we would embody this honesty, this vulnerability, this transparency with one another. That only once I bring something into the light can it actually then be healed and helped and restored. And if I keep it to myself and all bottled up, uh, there's no future there, there's no potential there. But if I find safe, godly community, if I find safe people to uh, have conversation with, if we ground it in the Word and in the presence of God, anything is possible. Honest fear. The second characteristic of us that we learn from Psalm 27 is this, antidotal beauty. Antidotal beauty. Psalm 27, verse 4 to 5, David continues, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek. Have you heard this before? Uh, such a joyous response that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. For in the day of trouble, He will keep me safe in His dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of His sacred tent and set me high upon a rock to gaze upon His beauty. I'd like to suggest that Actually, what we find in the presence of God when we come together in a place like this and we worship and we read Scripture and we consider God again, week in, week out, every time we gather, we are gazing upon an antidotal beauty, a beauty that heals, a beauty that restores, a beauty that overcomes, a beauty that is more powerful than our fear. Tim Keller says this, the best answer to our fears is a preoccupation with the beauty and the glory of God. Oh, come on, church, how amazing are the idea that we get to gaze upon a beauty that is not earthly, that is heavenly. And we open our hearts and we raise our hands and we surrender and we are swept up in His beauty again and again and again. This is actually... Uh, this Psalm 27, uh, the first mention of this kind of beauty in the Bible. The first mention of, of this kind of beauty. It had been spoken of before in terms of honor or title or rank, but David is speaking of it as a, a beauty that has an awe and a wonder about it. 
a pleasantness to us, uh, to it, one commentary says. A beauty that sweeps us up, that enamors us, that we can't take our eyes off to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Uh, with your worries and your stress and your fears and the things that we carry inside of ourselves, I want to encourage you tonight that the, the antidote that you need, the remedy, the medicine, the healing that you need is actually to gaze upon His beauty again. That in that place, transformation occurs. That in that place, a peace comes in. That in that place, God takes the weight and the pressure off. Antidotal beauty. It's when I find something more captivating than my fears. That I'm able to let go of my fears and reach out for what's so much better. God and a relationship with Him, His presence, and all that He promises over my life. Ed Welch, a Bible commentator, describes it so well, this exchange. Beauty is just what worry needs. Worry's magnetic attraction can only be broken by a stronger attraction. And David is saying, we can only find that attraction in God Himself. Wow. Are you hearing this tonight? Is this helping, church? A beauty that is only found in God Himself. The stronger and more powerful the fear, the stronger and more powerful the antidote must be. And the only antidote strong and powerful enough is the beauty and the presence of God. Here is what is astounding about this psalm. David's situation hadn't changed. He's still got all the enemies all around him, but when he sees God's beauty, David changes. Your situation may not have changed at the turn of the calendar year, but, but I want to encourage you. There is this offer tonight from God to enter into His presence so confidently. And when you do, the potential is that despite the fact that the world around us hasn't changed, that, that you can, that you can walk out and approach it differently, that He will empower you, that He will grace you, that He will anoint you. Antidotal beauty is what we find in His presence, and I believe it's also what we should find in community. It should characterize us, that we are obsessed and enamored and in awe with God's beauty. A tradition of us. If the team could come and join me, the third characteristic I wanna suggest tonight is a confident waiting. A confident waiting. Psalm 27 goes on and David expresses a little bit more of his emotion, his frustration, his worry, and he, he kind of stirs himself up and lands so emphatically right at the end of this psalm, verse 13 and 14. He summarizes all of what he has just said with this church. Listen tonight. David resolved and convinced it says in verse 13, I remain confident of this. Despite all that's been, despite all I'm facing, despite opposition, I remain confident of this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. We should be a people that are defined, marked by a confident waiting. Not a worrisome waiting, not a nervous waiting, not a divided waiting, but a confident waiting. Imagine a waiting that bred confidence. When I think of waiting and myself, I'm not, I'm not too great at waiting. I think of annoyance and frustration. I get all sorts of reactions when I'm, I'm made to wait. But how is a waiting, a confident waiting, how is that even possible? Don't you wonder as well, how is that possible? Yeah, I'd love that, Sam. Sounds great. Sounds ethereal. Sounds, you know, out there. Good on David. But, but how can I possibly confidently wait for what I want, for what I'm praying, for what I'm believing for? How could I wait for rescue, restoration? How can I confidently wait in this state of, God, will you do it this week? Will you do it next week? Will you do it the week after? How can we confidently wait for all of that, all that 2021 entails? 
and holds for us. I believe it's possible when we trust the outcome and the timing to the one who has spoken, who has promised, the one who operates in the unseen long before anything ever becomes seen. That's how we confidently wait. We trust Him with the outcome. That it's actually not on me to strive. It's not on me to figure it out in and of myself, in my own strength. It's not on me to worry it through. But you and I as people of faith have been asked, invited, encouraged, connected with this this trust, this expectation that God is leading us forwards and upwards. And so if we trust the outcome to Him and His timing, we can be. We can enjoy His presence. We can enjoy the community that we are a part of, the people that we're doing life with, all the while waiting for God. And if it hasn't happened yet, He is still working because He's the God who works in the unseen long before it ever results or appears in my scene. Confidently waiting. A tradition of us. A tradition of us. And I really prayed about tonight and the state of last year and what came our way and what could I offer tonight that would be of help to the city campus and those that are watching online uh, that would potentially bring us to a point of healing or a a point of connecting with with God's presence again in a way that His beauty overwhelms. And uh, What do we really need to hear tonight in light of the year ahead and where we're headed? And it's that this room and the people that you're sitting next to, that they matter. That you're not here by coincidence. That I think God had everything to do with the fact that you're in this place, in this house, at this time. And that person sitting in front of you or behind you. And that some way God is orchestrating this beautiful story of our lives, of your life. Coming together, working together and becoming something that we could not be in and of ourselves, a tradition of us. We actually need each other. I'd encourage you to give that time, give that thought, give that space in your life. Ask somebody out for coffee. Start your connect group again. Let's get it going. We need community. Uh, That this gathering on a weekend is actually so important to your faith and my faith and our faith and what God is doing in and through our church. That me being in the room, it matters deeply for me, but also me being in the room matters deeply to the people that are in the room. A tradition of us. You know that word wait, it's interesting. It doesn't appear in the New Testament. The way it's said here in the Hebrew that David uses, it's not used in the New Testament. Isn't that so cool? Why wouldn't it appear? Why wouldn't wait appear in the New Testament? Because in Jesus, we find all that we are waiting for. And Jesus is our answer, our hope, our confident waiting. Uh, Tonight, we have opportunity to connect again with Him. To be reminded that our lives are are so infused to, to His life. His example is the thing that inspires, that teaches, that instructs, that the person of Jesus is perfect in every way. The way that He loved and served humanity the way that He birthed the church in and through His life and His teaching, that we're connected to Him. So we always have hope. We always have promise. We always have much to be expectant for. Could I pray for us tonight? Why don't we stand to our feet? I wonder if I could ask actually, I feel to pray for anybody in the room tonight. And um, you just know that last year in 2020, and it goes without saying, but nonetheless, that you felt a disconnect over the last 12 months from people, from community, from faith. And you just know in yourself right now, hey, I I, I actually need to make a a conscious decision that I'm I'm gonna plant myself in community this year. Uh, that I believe what you're talking about, Sam, that I am created for community to do life with others, people that are like me, people that are not like me. I need them and they need me. That there are things on my life that are, are gonna be brought forth and brought out, developed and grown in and through relationship with people in this room. And if that's you tonight and you just know, yeah, I need to make a recommitment to this place and to 
uh, my church community, uh, the people around me, the people I'm doing life with. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Right around the room, why don't you just raise your hand? Shoot it up and uh, let me pray for you this evening. God, you see so many hands around the room. If that's you, shoot it up. Just before God and, and really just as a sign that you're making uh, this commitment in your heart. I need us and I wanna be a part of us. Lord, you see every hand. And I pray that you would do what only the Holy Spirit can right now. Resolve in us this hunger, this passion, this, this joy to be a part of life with others. What a beautiful thing. I am because we are. That this room represents so much for every single individual. And so I pray tonight, uh, you'd stir in our hearts a new commitment to community. I pray tonight that God, you would uh, go to work on behalf of every person with their hand raised to orchestrate relationships and connections and conversations and encouragement and words of discernment and moments that, that deepen the relationships and the friendships in this place. Lord, I thank You that we are the church and You've called us to move forward together to accomplish Your mission on this earth to go and be Jesus' hands and feet in the community of Sydney, the community of Waterloo and Redfern and Hurstville and Maroubra. God, that is what we represent. Seal it in our hearts. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Amen. Could I pray one more prayer tonight? And that's for any person in the room or even if you're watching online, this is for you as well, wherever you are. God sees you and He knows you. And if tonight you just know that there has been a disconnect between you and the person of Jesus, maybe you were once living for Him or for whatever reason, uh, over the last season or period of your life, you've made decisions that you know have led you astray. Tonight I'd love to pray a prayer, a simple but powerful prayer that allow, allows you to align your life with Him again. It's a prayer of repentance, which essentially just means turning from the way I've been living to to God, turning back to Him, turning to Him and receiving what He has for me. And that's it. You don't have to behave your way in or perform your way in. Just receive. Receive His grace, His love, His forgiveness. And you start this friendship that grows you, that teaches you. You follow Jesus, you learn about Him and it impacts you and transforms you. And if you're in this place tonight or online and you need to pray that prayer, I'd love to lead you in it. And so heads bowed and eyes closed one more time, right around the room. If you need to respond tonight and make your peace with God, reconnect with Him. Awesome, man, I see you back there. I'm just gonna ask that on the count of three, you raise your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it. Shoot it up, you can put it straight back down online, right where you're at. Maybe you wanna raise your hand just as a sign of surrender, but one, two, three, right around the room. Why don't you raise your hand? Let me include you in this moment. Amazing, man. Congratulations. Thanks for being so brave. Anybody else tonight? Thank you so much. Phenomenal. Anybody else, just a moment longer online if you're connected as well. Why don't you surrender, raise your hand or put your hand to your heart. If that's you, fantastic. Quite a few more hands over here, fantastic. That is so cool. That is what we're all about as a church. Let me lead you in this prayer. and I'll say a few words and you repeat after me. And I really do believe this is a prayer that starts you in a relationship with Jesus that changes everything for you. And why don't you say this after me, church? Dear Lord God, I thank you for Jesus. Your Son, who died on the cross for me and rose from the grave to forgive me of my sins and give me a brand new start tonight. From this moment on, I'm living for Jesus, my Lord, my Saviour, my greatest friend. Amen, amen. Come on, church, you know what to do. We celebrate with every person. Amen and amen. Hey, if that was you, we want to get you a Bible after the service. If you're in the room and straight afterwards, our team will be out there in the foyer with a big smile and they'd just love to place one of these Bibles in your hand and why don't you just have a quick conversation with them. We'd love to help out in any way that we can as a church and any way that you're comfortable with us doing so. And to take the Bible as you read this, you're gonna learn more about Jesus who uh, can transform your life in the best of ways. If you're online, why don't you just write in the chat, I prayed that prayer and our team would love to connect with you as well. And uh, help you out in, in whatever way that you would uh, like us to connect you with church, wherever you're located. And so one more time, why don't we put our hands together for every person. Amen.